Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Vice President EMEA, Google Cloud, Sebastian Marot. Morning, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to Google Next uh, Amsterdam 2017. Uh, we are super excited, very thrilled to have all of you here. Uh, we have put a lot of energy, a lot of passion to organize this day. It's really a very important day. So welcome to this uh, nice, little, charming uh, Dutch house. Uh, it's kind of a cool place. Uh, uh, we've put also a lot of efforts to uh, uh, renovate this place and to build this place for you. Uh, I was told that uh, this used to be a ship uh, manufacturing, uh, so a factory, uh, which was built in 1920. And uh, from 1920 to 1924, they have doubled uh, uh, the production of ship here. So uh, they moved from downtown to this place. Uh, so it's a really cool place. So welcome. Super excited uh, uh, to host this day. It's, um, you know, it's a great event for us. It's a bit of a world tour we have done uh, during the past few weeks. We started uh, in uh, San Francisco, uh, I think it was in uh, something like April, May. And uh, at that time, uh, we have met more than 100 product customer uh, and partner announcements. So a lot of great things that we've been announcing. Uh, uh, and uh, today is going to be also very cool because we're probably going to make additional few announcements. So uh, it's uh, a great opportunity. I think most of the audience today is coming from uh, a development community. So it's a great opportunity for us to connect our engineers with the developer community. But today is going to be really a great opportunity also to hear from our customers uh, how they are turning uh, these amazing new technologies uh, into very innovative ideas that are really changing the way they run their business. So a lot of great stuff, customer stories, a lot of product demonstration, and a lot of discussions around what is really important uh, to consider when you're starting this journey uh, into the cloud, because this is definitely a journey. So I want to spend a few minutes uh, uh, on a few things. First of all, for a lot of you, it's a bit of a discovery. Uh, the question mark is, what is this Google Cloud business? Uh, for others, uh, you're going to deep dive into uh, some part of the story and some part of the technology. So why don't we start, first of all, about Google Cloud. Uh, if you think about Google Cloud, uh, Google Cloud is pretty much the extension of everything we have been doing at Google since we created the company. I was not there in 1998. I had an immense privilege, actually, to start this business in Europe, the Google Cloud business, six, seven years ago. But when you think about uh, 1998, uh, when Larry and Sergey created the company, they had a vision and a mission which is still very much in play today. It's really to organize uh, the world information and to make it uh, accessible and useful for everyone in, uh, on Earth. And think about uh, the enterprise space. We are running, we are part of uh, great companies, whether you're a digital native or you're an enterprise uh, uh, company. And it's exactly the same. Think about it. It's really about the data. We are just managing, swimming into the data, whether it's customer data or it's industrial data. And what we really care at Google is really to turn this data into a comprehensive uh, business models, into innovation, so that you can not only change the way you run your business, but more importantly, really build a competitive advantage uh, uh, to uh, build what's next. And this is why this event is called Next. We really care about uh, what is going to be next, which products, services you are going to uh, create for your customers, uh, and again, to be uh, more competitive. And at the end of the day, actually, at Google, we realized that uh, it was just pretty much what we were doing. Uh, so as I said, since the beginning of our story, but this is the way we have built our own company, and this is the way we have grown our company. You know, if you think about it, Google Cloud is really the enterprise business, and it's really built on three or four very important pillars. One is the uh, data center and the infrastructure we have been building. The other one is the amazing network that we have built around the globe, actually, to be able to, uh, to transfer this data and to process this data. The other one is mobility, if you had to think about a third pillar. And the last one, and the last one is the one we are talking about pretty much everywhere, which is machine learning and artificial intelligence, uh, which is being baked uh, in everything we are doing right now. So think about the platform. 
At the end of the day, our mission is really to deliver a highly scalable, uh, open and secure platform to build your business if you're a digital native uh, or to build what's next if you're an enterprise company. And we've got a few layers. And this is very important, actually, because this is really how we're going to run this day together. The first one, which is super important, is infrastructure. I mean, nothing would have been, would have been happen without the infrastructure that we have been building at Google. All these data centers uh, that we have been building and that we are expanding in across all the different geographies. And the good thing, if you think about uh, the Netherlands and the Benelux, uh, we have one of the largest uh, infrastructure and data centers around the world in this region, so which is really great. This is infrastructure that we have inherited, and this is infrastructure that is hosting, probably you heard about that, uh, more than seven services uh, that are being used by more than a billion users. Uh, and that's super important. I mean, there is no way you're going to be able to manage in your enterprise the volume of data that is right now floating into your company without the capacity to, uh, uh, the, the super capacity actually to host this data. So this is also, and that you probably don't know actually, all, if you think about our Google Cloud customer, I mean, they are themselves servicing more than a billion users uh, within their community. This is really the infrastructure that is hosting our amazing uh, uh, products around data analytics uh, and around machine learning. So this is important. The other thing which is very important uh, is what we are providing to the developer community. And uh, a lot of things are going to be demonstrated today. Uh, whether it's uh, all the smart API, APIs that uh, you can find, uh, the translation API, the video APIs, the vision API, all this set of API run natural language uh, that are here totally open and usable, or this amazing actually uh, products uh, uh, around container management or Kubernetes, and again, all these smart APIs. So we are really investing for the developer community. Uh, which is extremely important, actually, to build, again, your next applications. Uh, the other thing that we care a lot about, and I know that we've got a lot of companies in the room that, is being, that are using these products, uh, is productivity. So uh, we not only want to deliver the right technology to build your next application, but you, we really want, actually, to help you changing the way you're working within your company by better engaging uh, your employees uh, uh, through some live collaboration processes. You know, I had a chance to, uh, again, join this company six, seven years ago, and I don't remember the last time I really attached a file in an email. This is totally over. I mean, it's really about live collaboration. It's about engaging people together, and we will have a specific uh, session on that, uh, which is totally changing, actually, the way people are working and really implementing, implementing a new culture within your company. The other thing we really care a lot about, and that you probably heard and you will hear more and more, it's all about our mobile strategy. And whether it's Android, of course, which is by far the uh, most used uh, operating system in the uh, uh, environment, in the mobile environment, uh, now we're getting into the enterprise space, uh, or the Chrome OS, uh, which is uh, probably uh, the more secure and shareable and easy operating system uh, to uh, access all of this information. Uh, there are a lot of studies right now stating that by 2018, 25% of the Fortune 500 companies uh, will start using Chrome OS as an operating system to securely work into their uh, company and into their environment. So, so this is the platform, this open platform that we are right now uh, delivering to the marketplace. So, what happens in 2017? I mean, we all know that the cloud is the thing that we need to uh, embrace and to adopt. Uh, we all know that uh, every single business, every single industry is being disrupted. I have, the, again, the privilege to meet a lot of executives. Uh, I used to uh, live in, uh, in America where we were, we were hosting a lot of uh, executives in our existing briefing centers. Uh, and every single executive coming from any kind of uh, industries uh, are telling us that their industry is being disrupted. And they really want to partner with us to figure out uh, how they can be leading this next uh, generation and this next uh, uh, business within their, their, their industry. So at the same time, the market is moving extremely fast. Uh, we are also investing a lot in this business. Uh, and you know, to be very candid, actually, three, two, three, four years ago, we were having questions about how serious Google was with this business. Uh, and for the past 24 to 36 months, uh, and I hope you've seen that actually, and we would like to get your feedback also, it's really important to get that today, 
we have been investing in making this company really an enterprise-ready company by releasing whether by, well, our engineers actually were releasing 500 releases during the next few years uh, or by launching these uh, new great products. Uh, and we have dedicated sessions to discover products like uh, cloud machine learning or like Spanner, but also by implementing some uh, technical resources and connecting, again, our engineers uh, uh, to our companies. So this is super important. There is another thing which is extremely important, uh, and you will have some sessions today. It's compliance, policy, and security. At the same time, everybody is moving to the cloud. What we are seeing is the highly regulated industries and companies are going to the cloud, and especially in Europe and in this country in particular, it is super important, actually, to spend a lot of time, efforts on compliance and security. The other thing that we are investing a lot of time uh, at Google Cloud uh, is to making sure that not only we can provide the best tools uh, and processes uh, around uh, machine learning, which I think is definitely where we are leading the game, or analytics, or big data and big query, but it's really about lifting and shifting uh, your on-premise workloads, workloads into the cloud. And we have dedicated teams, actually, to help you migrating this. So we are here to solve business issues, uh, whichever, actually, you, can, you, you are belonging to. So whether you're an hospital or a bank, uh, or whether you are uh, running a store, or you're building a video game, or you're running a media company, or you're making energy, I think mean, we are seeing a lot, a lot of uh, companies coming to us uh, and adopting our business. So if you are, for instance, we've got a lot of digital natives, historically, companies in Europe very close to my heart, actually, like Spotify, or very famous companies like eBay or Snapchat, they literally built, Snapchat built its business on Google Cloud. Companies like Spotify that I mentioned moved all their workloads into Google Cloud, actually, to uh, go to the next step and really provide a much better uh, business experience and, and, and build, actually, competitive advantage to be leading, actually, the market they're operating into. But you're seeing on these slides a lot of, sort of very traditional companies. And this is where it's fascinating, actually, to be part of their journey on how we can really coach these companies uh, to move uh, a success to successfully to the cloud and step by step. I think one of the uh, largest companies we've been working or we are starting the journey with, and probably you had a chance to uh, listen to Daryl West, uh, the global CIO, uh, when he was in uh, San Francisco, is HSBC. Think about HSBC. It's probably the oldest bank in the world. They have been in the business for 150 years. Uh, and it's uh, probably one of the most conservative uh, companies in the world. I mean, in the most uh, regulated uh, industry, of course, which is the banking industry. And it's fascinating to see that a company that has been created 150 years ago, of course, has generated a lot, a lot of data. Actually, it's funny because it took them 130 years to start measuring their data into terabytes. And for the past 20 years, actually, they have generated 15 terabytes. And now they are thinking about how they are going to handle an additional five terabytes just for the next 12 months. This is what we are talking about. It's really a total explosion. So if you think about HSBC again, which is a very traditional company, they did everything right for the past 20 years. They started with regional database, and then they reached the limit, and they moved progressively actually to the uh, traditional data warehousing uh, that were available 15, 20 years ago. And they found that warehouses started to be really expensive and difficult to manage. So what have they done? They moved to this big data actually technologies with Hadoop, uh, and they found it extremely challenging because suddenly they had actually to learn about these technologies, they had to learn how to feed actually this technology, they had uh, to uh, build infrastructure, they had to maintain infrastructure, and it was extremely challenging. So what they've done actually, they started to figure out that this is a data game, and they didn't want actually to turn a company into a uh, I mean, a competitor of Google or any of our competitors, actually, they just wanted to run their business. So they have decided to select Google to start this analytical journey, this cloud journey. So they are moving the bank to the cloud, and they are moving uh, the bank to the cloud with Google. So it's, uh, again, a journey. We are just starting, but it's really fascinating. And we are seeing more and more of these cases right now. So I'd like to end on two things. Number one, I really want to uh, thank all the partners that are in the room. Uh, you have an amazing exhibition. It's extremely important for us. Uh, 
you know, if you want to be an enterprise-ready organization, which we are, you need actually to create this partner ecosystem. So it's very close to our hand, uh, to our heart, sorry. <laughs> and uh, not only, I mean, it's important to onboard some technological partners, but also some resellers, then uh, also some global system integrators that are going to help you, uh, again, migrating your workloads uh, and also building what's next in your organization. So spend some time with these guys. Uh, uh, they have invested in this event, and they are able actually to uh, uh, tell you more about uh, the value they can bring to your organization. At the end of the day, again, what I said, it's, it's a journey. And very honestly and candidly, I mean, it's really about you. And, and the kind of discussions we are having with our customers, uh, I mean, are very interesting because this is so new. This is so new for everyone. How many times actually we are sitting down with our customers and they are just asking us, how should I get started? How do, how do, do, do I do it? What is the, really, what do I need actually? Who should I recruit? How can I find the talents? Uh, how can I, what am I going to do with my IT uh, current organization? How can I train these people? How much is it going to cost me? Am I going to be again locked into a kind of uh, uh, partnership or so-called partnership with an IT company? Do I have to rewrite my code? I mean, all of these questions are really the questions that we are trying to help you answering. And this is why, I mean, uh, something that Diane Green uh, decided very quickly when she came on board two years ago, they, she's our CEO, she, she was the founder of VMware. I mean, Diane said, we have probably the best technology we can find right now in the market, but stop just bidding here. It's not only about technology, it's about the ability to, to build an enterprise organization and connect our technical people to making sure that we can help you uh, building this project. So, you will see a lot of Googlers, we call that Googlers, we are Googlers, and uh, in, the, in the room, uh, you might see some what we call customer success engineer that will help you piloting and prototyping uh, your, your application. You're going to see a lot of engineers also, as I said earlier on, uh, that will uh, really help you to drive the right technical conversations. Uh, you will see some dedicated architects that are organized by industry. We call them the office of the CTO. It's like we have tens of CTO in the organization and they are here again to sit down with you. And I'm so proud and happy actually to have a lot of them here today in the, in the room. So connect with this uh, uh, CTO and also professional services organization. Again, that will help you and help our partners uh, uh, to uh, uh, implement and to migrate your application. So this is what it is about. Uh, we are going to super excited to spend the day together. We have a lot to share with you, a lot of product demos and customer stories. And uh, without waiting, I'm going to pass it over to Julien Blanchet, who is going to tell us about security, privacy, and compliance. Thank you. Th welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Sebastian. Uh, I hope the audience will cope with another 15 minutes of French accent. Um, let's see if you can spot through the day how many accents we have and where we come from, each and every one of us. My name is Julien Blanchet. I've been working nine years with Google. The last four years engaged um, with the engineering, security, and compliance teams uh, in California. I recently relocated back to Brussels, and my role now is to engage with regulators and large prospects, large customers, to help answer you know, the detailed questions uh, and facilitate the communication between the European market and these engineering teams. Um, so today, millions of companies are considering to move all or some of their workloads to the cloud. And they have several reasons to do that. One of the reasons that you might not have expected uh, to be uh, so prominent and to actually be the first one a cloud provider talks about is security. And yet, it is a widely accepted fact today that large cloud platforms offer a significant capability to improve your security stance. And there are a number of reasons for that that I want to go over in the next few minutes. <clears throat> When you want to assess the capability of a security system, there is a well-known framework that recommends to look at the capability to anticipate, the capability to defend, and the capability to react. When it comes to anticipation, large cloud platforms like Google um, 
have a significant advantage. You know, we, as uh, Sebastian was saying, Google is operating eight products with more than a billion users. Actually, Google Photo just passed the billion user mark a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so this would you know, add one to this list. So you can imagine the amount of information, the amount of exposure, the amount of testing we get every single day to know what is happening on the cloud. And I just want to highlight one, um, uh, one of these platforms. Google Android today is two billion devices. And Google Android has a service called SafetyNet that you can Google if you want. And SafetyNet polls every single day 400 million Android devices to gather the security information from the devices and allows our teams to build a close to real time you know, cartography of the threat landscape. So this gives you an idea of the amount of information and knowledge you can benefit from when you operate on these, uh, on these platforms. Going on to defense, our infrastructure teams had a great luxury 18 years ago when they started to build these platforms. They could start, they could start sorry, from a blank slate. They did not have to cope with generations of legacy technology that is creating the complexity that in one word really summarizes the security challenge today. It is not to say that Google is not complex, right? Google is two billion lines of codes, 20 to 30,000 engineers interacting daily onto two billion lines of codes, 40 to 50,000 change requests per day on the code. So this complexity is, is mastered by automation, intelligent automation, not to use the buzzword of machine learning and artificial intelligence here. But these systems have allowed to tackle successfully great security challenges like spam, for example, and will allow to tackle some of the big problems like authentication, and I will be elaborating on this more this afternoon in the security breakout. So when regulators today are talking about security by design, and this is becoming a very important criteria, these platforms and Google has embedded security into the system, but also intelligent, the intelligent mechanisms that learn to adapt to the evolving nature of these threats. Next, I want to talk about the level of control that Google has managed to keep over the entire technology stack. Because of the size we operate at, from the hardware to the operating system, you know, all the way up to the user interface, Google has kept a very high level of homogeneity um, has developed and deployed its own technology and kept this level of homogeneity across the technology stack. This level of homogeneity is what allows us to identify threats or incidents relatively faster and react relatively faster because we have less you know, different solutions to bring and are less dependent on external suppliers. Now, in this time where notification breach and the speed at which you can react and notify your data privacy authorities, you know, this kind of capabilities is going to be critical. And this is the kind of um, uh, strength that you really want to have on your side. Then we should all be aware of the importance of a global infrastructure in this security game. Today, Google is 15 data centers across, located across the world, four of them in Europe, Finland, Ireland, Belgium, the Netherlands. Two more coming before the end of the year, or very soon. Um, but most importantly, these data centers are connected by our own proprietary fiber. And this network infrastructure allows us also to deliver you very low latency, but most importantly, when it comes to security, be much more in control of our own destiny when it comes to transport data from one continent to the other. More importantly, this kind of global infrastructure allows us to aim to deliver the same level of security for everybody. You are not going to, be, to receive more security if you're in Germany than if you're in China or in Pakistan, for that matter, or in the US. So, this is the capability of these large platforms and really the mission of the Google security teams to deliver the same level of security to everybody. Now, these security discussions can go on for days, you know, with large prospects, 
weeks sometimes, if we really dig into the detail and answer all the questions, they all end up to the same conclusions. Large cloud platforms offer significant improvement of what most companies can deliver today. But they all leave our prospect with the same feeling that you probably have at this right moment, when you realize that to benefit, for that, for, to benefit from that security, you need to load your data onto a third-party infrastructure. And this requires a leap of faith. This requires a level of confidence that we cannot force onto you. All that we can do is be more transparent, share more information, tell you where our data centers are located, tell you who our sub-processors are, show you the dashboards, public, live, of availability of our systems, to allow you to build that confidence to come to sign the contract. When you sign the contract, this is when you really gain legal control over how your data will be managed. And you will be looking for clauses like scope of processing, the commitment that Google will not use your data for any other purpose than deliver you the service that you paid for. The commitment on intellectual property, portability, the contractual commitment that you can leave the infrastructure at any given moment, how we will react to a third-party request to access your data, international jurisdiction, you know, will be also added to these clause. The commitment that we will keep the security certifications during, that we have now during the entire duration of the agreement with you. And finally, the capability that you have to verify that we do what we say through audits, you know, and the capability to audit our, our systems. Now, most of you and most of your stakeholders that you uh, will have to go out and convince um, will be wondering how this can work within the legal framework in Europe. And, uh, notably, with the arrival of the GDPR, you know, this new regulation that is going to increase dramatically the power of the data privacy authorities to invest to make sure that we all do what we should do when it comes to handling data. The, the deadline is coming close, and that is why we have announced several weeks ago already our firm commitment for Google Cloud. You know, Google Cloud Platform and G Suite will comply with the expectations of the GDPR, and you will be receiving in the coming weeks and months you know, new legal terms that really confirm that you have these commitments that will allow, will allow you to remain compliant with the European regulation. The, G, the, the GDPR is very specific on one topic, which is international data transfers. And Article 46 of the GDPR is what you want to Google if you want to have the legal text. I encourage you to do that. It is actually, for once, a very easy, simple, clause uh, article to read, Article 46 specifies very clearly that a data controller, which is you, or a data processor, which is us, uh, may only export European data outside of Europe if adequate safety measures are in place. And that is why, back in January, we had our adequate safety measures, you know, uh, as described in our standard, model, uh, standard contractual clauses added to our contract, we had them verified and approved by the European institutions. That clearly means that under the GDPR, you will not be required to keep data only in Europe when you're using a Google Cloud platform. You may do so, you may not do so, you may use the platform as you wish if you have these contract clauses. Now, very clearly, when you engage into the cloud, you understand that there is a significant portion of the compliance and security demands of the regulators that are going to be managed by Google. And this portion will vary depending if you implement software as a service, platform as a service, of in, in, um, uh, infrastructure as a service. But even in the green area, where regulators and your customers will be expecting you to raise your game you know, and deliver to the new level of expectations of the European regulator, Google technology can help you achieve these goals. And I just want to tease you with a couple of the building blocks that are available um, that, and we can discuss further during the day. The strong authentication ranks very high on the list of regulators today and the list of hackers today when it comes to assess your capability to defend. Rolling out these security keys 
you know, that are a two-step authentication factor hardware token that we have rolled out at Google several years ago can significantly improve your capability. Um, enforcing their usage is also a good idea. Just talking about authentication. Another big topic is anonymization. The regulator requires you now to anonymize and encrypt the data. When using Google Cloud technology, your data is encrypted by default. This is a significant differentiator versus other platforms. We will manage the encryption for you. If you decide, you may manage your own keys, you may manage the keys themselves, yourself, sorry, or you may bring your own encryption keys to remain completely in control of your data. Finally, in the spirit of Heen Woden Mar Daden, I want to introduce Peter, <laughs> um, who will demonstrate the capability of the Data Loss Prevention API, which will allow you to uh, scan your own data to identify you know, personal information or sensitive data, sometimes even possibly in real time in your systems, and that can greatly help you uh, in your journey towards the GDPR. Peter? Thank you, Julien. Um, I want to show you a short demo of an enterprise application that can be used in a customer service organization. So this is a, a chat application. And in this scenario, we've been chatting with Angela, solving her issue. Now, typically, in such a uh, chat, you would ask for some personal information to make sure you look up her history, uh, see if she had other issues uh, before, and that sort of stuff. So we asked for her name and her contact number. And she did provide that. But in the meantime, she gave us so much more. She gave her insurance number, and she even uploaded a picture of her passport. Now, that's probably not the smartest thing to do, but it gives us a problem, right? Because if we want to store the content of this chat, which is commonly done, um, we have a problem because it contains personal identifiable information. So we can't use it for auditing, we can't use it for analysis, we can't use it for training purposes, and so forth. So what the DLP API provides, it provides a mechanism to take the content of this chat, run it through the API, and provide a redacted version of this content where all the personal information has been removed. So let me respond to Angela, thanking her. And end the chat. So now all the content is running through the API. And what you will notice here is that all the information that is personal has been redacted. We see that her name was taken out. We see that her phone number has been remo removed, insurance number. We even went into the picture to take out her face and remove any uh, uh, sensitive content from the picture as well. And to show you that this is live, I have a small um, document scanner set up here. I have a sample of a Dutch passport. It's fake, so you don't need to take pictures. Um, I can put it under the scanner, click on the capture image, and it will run through the API, and it will correctly identify the burger service number, and it will take out the face. So that's an example how you can apply the data loss prevention API in your organization in an enterprise application. Back to you, Julian. Thank you, Peter. Very impressive. Thank you. When you speak to your risk managers in your organization, and you hear how worried they are about every single one of us organizing the birthday parties of our children through our corporate emails, and capturing thereby the identity of all these children, of all their parents, and then you know, having the regulator comes in two years and asking, why did you keep that information? This is the kind of technology that will help your risk managers. Okay. So I do not want to leave you without a parting thought. Um, often faced with, at the end of these discussions, you know, you're faced with executives that have to decide whether they go to the cloud or not go to the cloud. Very confusing decision. And I, since a few weeks, recommend now to divide the decision process into four different um, steps. The first is to make a purely technical risk assessment. Where is your data going to be safer from a purely technical point of view? And I'm quite confident, very confident actually, that this process will lead to the direction we talked about in the last few minutes. Then, 
engage into a legal assessment. What does the law really require? And as we've discussed about the GDPR, it will unify the legal landscape in Europe. It has very clear expectations. The discussions, the legal discussions, are actually getting much easier by the month. Then make a political assessment. There are a number of countries today that are passing laws to keep the data in country. And you need to be sure that your cloud provider can cope with these demands. These countries, you know them. Two years ago, Russia. Six months ago, China. And our teams are very paying a lot of attention to a couple of other countries in the center part uh, of the world, you know, the Middle East at the moment, where these, these decisions could also take place. You get the picture. Data location laws are very rarely meant to improve the privacy of the data. Nevertheless, you need to remain operational in these countries. Can your cloud provider guarantee the security of the data while at the same time satisfying the expectations of these regulators? Important assessment. Finally, the cultural assessment. You, will be, you might be faced with reactions like I see a lot in France, for example. I'm a French company, I want my data to remain in France. Um, or you have unions that have expectations for the data remain in France. Or your data is you know, deemed national treasure. Very fine. These are very good reasons why you might not be able to get the data outside. But make sure that when you go through your decision process, you clearly dis make a distinction between these four different levels and prioritize them accordingly in your decision. This is the last thing I want to say before introducing you to Tino, who will tell you more about machine learning and our big data capabilities. Tino, thank you. Thank you, Julian. No French accent, I'm sorry. Well, I am absolutely ecstatic to be here. I, I absolutely love Amsterdam. The, the energy, the, the sophistication, the, the technical talent here is just astonishing. And on a personal level, Amsterdam is one of my favorite places in the whole world. It's just such a tremendous place to be here. And I, I'm, just, I'm just beyond uh, ecstatic here. So Julian did a fantastic job um, telling you how Google can protect your organization from a security point of view. I'd like to talk about a little bit of a different angle, and uh, that's basically data. How can an organization embrace data? Because the, the reality of today's world, today's uh, um, environment, is that you must be a data company in order to succeed. So you must have an innovation partner that can help you manage your data and get the most value out of the data, provide analytics, help you understand your customers, and help interact with the world through machine learning and artificial intelligence. So, but the reality of today's uh, technical environment, again, is that infrastructure is very complex. Your engineers are tasked with a number of of day-to-day uh, -day engagements that, uh, you know, uh, uh, there's a whole lot of things that you must do every single day in order to just keep the lights on. And these things are relatively low value. You, you can consider them tinkering with infrastructure. And the, the, the one little bit that really provides value to organization is, can be very, very, very small, relatively small. So what if you could flip that equation on its head? So Google Cloud Platform provides a large number of services that are very, very high level, fully managed services that abstract away a lot of complexity of managing your own infrastructure and your own services. A very, very high level of abstraction, very, very high level of automation that allows your engineers to focus on what's really important to your organization and try to provide value, right? Which accelerates your uh, base of innovation, allows you to iterate, allows you to delight your customers, allows you to focus on your customers. And I'm delighted to present George here from Philips, who is going to talk about how Philips has uh, implemented Google Cloud Platform and solved their issues uh, when implementing uh, the Philips Hue platform. George? Thank you, Timo. <laughs> it's a great pleasure to be here today to tell you about my product, Philips Hue, and how we're using the Google Cloud Platform to connect lighting to the internet and hopefully change it for everyone forever.
Philips Lighting is the world's largest lighting company. And I'm pretty confident when I say that every single person in this room has experienced at least one of our products. Whether it's with regular lighting you have in your own homes, lighting you walked under in street lamps on the way here, or the lighting in one of the thousands of monuments, like the Rijksmuseum here in Amsterdam, that we light. One of the key drivers of my company is transforming the role of lighting by making it more connected. We believe that we can leverage the fact that lighting is everywhere ubiquitously around us to make the world easier to personalize, easier to monitor, easier to manage, and easier to control. My product, Philips Hue, is our answer to that in the consumer space. It's one of the most popular smart home products in the world. And what we really believe is that we can totally transform the role that lighting plays in your home. We believe that lighting can be an alternative to having a guard dog by making it seem like you're at home when you're away on vacation. We believe that lighting could be an alternative to your morning cup of coffee by leveraging the physiological response our body has to different shades of white light. We believe that lighting is an alternative to painting your home and decorating by being able to change the look and feel of a space multiple times a day by changing the brightness and color of your lights. We even believe that lighting could be an alternative to a surround sound system by extending the experience of the screen into your room with synchronized light scripts. And we can do all of this while making your home more convenient and comfortable. Now, we started with Philips Hue back in 2012. And from the very beginning, we knew we needed to have a cloud backend. We needed to be able to keep our products up to date in the field. We needed to be able to understand and learn from how people were using the system to make it better over time. We needed to give the ability for consumers to control their lights when they weren't at home, so that they could have the lights automatically be on when they arrived home and be able to check that they hadn't left things on when they were away. And we also knew we wanted to connect our lighting to react to other cloud services, like If This Then That, so that all of your lights in your home can flash red when your favorite sports team scores. All of these told us we needed a cloud platform, but we also had some unusual requirements. The way we actually serve this cloud service towards our customers is we bundle it for free in the initial purchase price of the product. And what that means is we actually have to bundle the lifetime cost of serving that customer into that initial purchase price. It's part of the bill of material of our product. So it's absolutely crucial for us, in order to keep the product affordable for consumers, that the incremental cost of serving a new home is kept as low as possible. In that way, we're able to actually make the purchase price of the product cheaper. We also needed to make sure that we could scale this product in a very cost-effective way. We didn't know when we started if this product would be hugely successful or would take slower to ramp up. And because we started as an internal startup, we didn't want to be lumbered with a huge operational overhead keeping this thing running. But equally, if it did take up very fast, which luckily it did, we need to be able to keep up with scaling. Google Cloud solved this for us, and we're constantly pleasantly surprised as the market keeps growing faster and faster that we're able to keep up with scaling in a very smooth way. Another thing which has become increasingly important is we care about latency. We've been trained the last 100 years of having lighting in our homes that when you press a button, the light turns on immediately. Why should it be any different if you have internet-connected lighting? So we put a lot of energy into optimizing the total latency from when you do an action which goes via the cloud to the lights reacting, becoming even more important with voice platforms in our home. We have a very broad partnership with Google. We use a wide variety of different Google Cloud products, but we also 
work very closely with the Android ecosystem and with the smart home products in the Google things like Nest and Google Assistant. So let's have a quick look at what it takes to actually turn on the light bulb in 2017. Let's start with, <laughs> let's start with a command from something like Google Assistant. So someone in their home, they get out their phone, and they say, OK, Google, turn off my lights. What happens? That command goes up to the Google infrastructure, does the voice recognition, generates the command, and it comes with a client request towards our API. The API is initially managed by Apogee, where we're handling that the command is properly authenticated and within the quotas of its application. That's then passed over towards a service that runs in Google Container Engine called Client Eastward, which handles that request, makes sure that it's connected to the right bridge, and routes that message via a Redis instant running on Compute Engine towards another container, which actually handles the connection towards bridges. The new way we're doing this now is with a service we call Freddy Mercury, which actually maintains a permanent open WebSocket towards every single bridge in the world. And we do that to get latency as low as possible. There's always a connection ready to take that command so we can turn on the lights immediately. It arrives there, and it's pushed down this WebSocket towards the bridge inside the home. The bridge takes that and sends out a Zigbee wireless message towards the lights in the home, and they turn off. And all of this happens in less than 300 milliseconds and happens millions of times every day. And that's how we turn on a light bulb in 2017 and how we're using Google Cloud Platform to do it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you George. Freddie Mercury. That was a fantastic story. And this, this, uh, these halls are filled with uh, customers and users today that are leveraging Google Cloud Platform for all kinds of exciting use cases. And I encourage you to share those stories with other folks in attendance here. And perhaps tomorrow or next year, you'll be on stage here with us. So as I mentioned before, data is really key to success in today's environment. Um, and uh, Google has really been at the forefront of this kind of, uh, of uh, attitude. As you may have heard, uh, Google's motto is to organize world's data and essentially provide very, very high level value to that data. Uh, we really mean that to heart. Google's culture is, is fanatically data-driven. All decisions are made through data-driven argument and debate. It can be actually a little bit uh, maddening sometimes. But so th this embrace of data is, is really key again. Um, and so in order to, um, to really take the first steps, let's say I convinced you, you should probably start by taking care of your operational, your transactional, your application database layer. And so I'm here to talk about Cloud Spanner, which is just an incredible technology. It's, it's, it's amazing. So traditionally, when building an operational application database, um, you had a binary choice. You were probably going to try to use a traditional relational database, which has rich SQL semantics, strong consistency, transactions. But sadly, a relational database doesn't really scale. Right. You may hit some limits, at which point you perhaps will choose to shard your uh, databases, which increases complexity of operations multiple times over. And so the, new, the NoSQL movement was born, where it traded away some of the, the really nice benefits of relational databases in exchange for horizontal scaling and in exchange for availability. So you don't get really nice SQL. You may not get strong consistency. You may not get... Uh, um, you might not get transactions, but you'll get scale, right? So, and Google recognizes, this, of course, that, that this is kind of an inefficient, this binary choice, we can do better than this. So Cloud Spanner was born. And at Google, Cloud Spanner has been in production for the past five or six years or so, running hundreds of applications, including some of our biggest ones like AdWords. So what is Cloud Spanner? It is the world's first horizontally scalable relational database. Cloud Spanner provides strong consistency of transactions, provides rich standard SQL dialect, and is a, 
has a very high level of abstraction. It's a fully managed service, so that you're not inundated with tasks like setting up infrastructure and identifying how to shard keys and so on and so forth. So Spanner lets you focus on what's important to your business. And again, of course, Spanner is replicated regionally and potentially even globally, right? which is a very new and novel concept. And of course, Spanner is battle-tested with Google, as I mentioned before. So how does Spanner achieve this? It sounds too good to be true, really. Um, there are two components that I should talk about here. The first one is TrueTime. TrueTime is a software and hardware service inside of Google that allows you to retrieve accurate timestamps within a, a non-zero error bound. TrueTime allows us to uh, serialize transactions with strong levels of confidence, and that's really the key to providing strong consistency uh, of transactions uh, that are spread geographically. The second one is a, is a very unique feature of, of Google that some folks before me may have mentioned, and that's Google's private network. Google manages your packets between data centers. So it will take a packet from data center A to data center B, and again, very, very high levels of confidence that those packets will make it there. That, those packets, your data never leaves Google network. And we're able to really understand when you know, any kind of degradation happens there. And so the other way to look at it is uh, you might have heard of the, the CAP theorem of distributed uh, systems. The CAP theorem basically says that uh, there, there are three aspects to distributed systems. There's the consistency, availability, and partitions. And what they mean by partitions is network partitions, which is just a, a nice way of saying that bad things happen to networks. And that's really what the CAP theorem says, is bad things happen to networks. So you have to choose between C and A, between consistency and availability. Google's private network allows us to minimize the P down to seconds a year. So that in reality, in theory, we still have the P to worry about. But in practice, the P is minimized so much that it's not a concern. So now you can have both consistency and availability. right? And that's what Spanner gives you. And now I have Robert, who has probably the best job at Google because he gets to play around with tools like Spanner every single day. He's going to give us a live demo of Spanner. Hi, thanks, Tina. So um, all that said, it sounds like it's going to be a, a lot of work to get Spanner up and running, no? Well, we've tried to reduce that to something very, very simple. So on this first screen, and I'll zoom in a little bit, we're actually going to create an instance. So let's call it Next Amsterdam. And we're going to choose here a number of nodes. So these are nodes of Spanner. And we're going to go for 42, obviously. And that's it. I'm in the process now, and I've just crea created and deployed my Spanner instance with 42 nodes. OK, that's really cool. But let's actually see a use case and see what happens. OK, so we're going to switch to our next tab. So what's going on here? We have an application. It's been deployed in three regions. So we have Europe, Asia, and North America. And basically, we've got about a billion tickets to sell. And we have 800,000 events. And what we're trying to do globally is sell these tickets to the customers who want to buy them. And obviously, we don't want to sell the same ticket to more than one person. So having a horizontal uh, available database is going to be really useful. So we've deployed Spanner in all of those three regions as well. And for this demo, we've actually deployed uh, Kubernetes clusters there as well to actually simulate this interaction. And as you can see at the moment, we've sold about 10 million tickets, and we're about 600,000 tickets per minute. So let's dive down a bit. This is the schema that we're using uh, for our ticket service. And I think there are two things to notice here. One, it looks like your everyday, relational, normalized database schema, which is great. Everyone can understand it. You can have a conversation around it with your analysts, with your developers. But let's look at one of these tables here. So the ticket table is already containing 1.8 billion rows. And that's in one table. That table isn't sharded. That's just one table that you can look at. And it doesn't matter if you're looking at it from America, Europe, or Asia, you just for your all intents and purposes, you're looking at a local table containing one billion rows. So the next thing I'm going to do is um, pull up a query and actually run a query against um, Spanner while, while we're doing all of this work. So let me just go and grab this query, which I 
prepared. So we should have a query here for Amsterdam. We're selecting that. OK. So I'm querying the data while all that other stuff is going on. And there's one thing I want you to notice about this query. If I zoom in, that might help a bit as well. This is a pretty normal looking SQL query. So something else that you get with Spanner. Normal, plain, SQL, interoperability. So the next thing we're going to do is add some more nodes to our Spanner instance. So you can imagine all this is going on. One of the things that Spanner actually offers you is to make uh, changes uh, to the schema real time, um, which is, would give you that ability to actually go and add new features to your, your, your system, your application. But what about if your application actually needs more power? Well, it's as simple as zooming in again, editing the instance, and saying, Give me some more nodes. And there we go. We've just got some more nodes. This um, <coughs> spanner, as with all of our Google Cloud products, is fully integrated. It's a fully managed service, as you've just seen. I'm not going in there and configuring things and doing all kinds of DevOps stuff. But what we've also done is made sure it's connected with our monitoring system, the stack driver. And I just want to pay attention here to a few graphs. So one of the graphs, this is, this is the period when we started loading this initial data into Spanner for this demo. And there are a few graphs here that you can have a look at. So these are the nodes going up and down. But this one here, when we started to load our data, we were going about 200 to 300 megabytes per second. And we actually increased that to get some more in to like 600 megabytes per second of loading data into our Spanner instance. And we're going to come back to this. And look what's happening. We're going to zoom in in America a little bit. And look at the latency there. We're selling there about 200,000 tickets a second, uh, a minute, sorry. So with that, I'm going to hand it back to Tina. That was Spanner. Wow, what an amazing database. The, just, just the fact alone that he was able to resize the size of a Spanner cluster so easily is transformative. These types of things took Google months and months to do before Spanner. And so you can take advantage of this today. Spanner went GA roughly a month ago, almost to the date. And again, Spanner gives you the best of both worlds. You get the nice SQL semantics. You get strong transactional layer of relational databases. But you get the scale characteristics and availability of uh, NoSQL databases. So please encourage you to take a look at Spanner. It's really exciting. Now that we've taken care of the application layer, now that we have our operational transactional database up and running, synced across the entire world, let's talk about how to get some more value out of this data, right? Because you really want to understand your customer. You want to delight them. You want to custom tailor, have custom tailor-made experiences for each individual customer. And at the same time, you want to be identifying opportunities potentially for, for future exploration and future innovation and future iteration. So really, the, the tool that, you uses, uh, that Google uses internally and Google customers use externally as well is BigQuery. BigQuery is a product that I had the pleasure of working on before coming over onto my new team. And BigQuery is essentially a serverless, fully managed analytics data warehouse. Uh, what do we mean by that? What we mean is that you never have to touch hardware again. You never have to uh, uh, resize your cluster. You never have to specify any kind of configuration like RAM, CPU, and so forth. BigQuery just works. BigQuery has two major components that you can think about. The first one is a sophisticated exabyte scale storage engine that allows you to move data into BigQuery in real time and share data sets across your organization or with your third parties uh, just the same way Google Docs allows you to share information. Besides storage, we have the execution engine, which allows you to execute standard SQL at the speed of thought. It gives your data scientists, your data engineers, your analysts the power to see inside of the data and understand the shape of the data. Uh, so, Customers, of course, prefer BigQuery for its 
price and performance characteristics, but they're most vocal about the operational simplicity aspect of BigQuery. It really is, is a set and forget technology. It's really no ops. It requires no workloads to my manage, right? You just you use BigQuery. But of course, in order to use BigQuery properly, just like any other database, you need to move data into BigQuery, which is potentially not the most glorious endeavor, right? ETL is hard, and you know, it's kind of a requirement. It's a means to an end. So for that purpose, if you have data sets that reside inside of Google, if you're an AdWords user, if you're a DoubleClick user, Google Annex Premium, and YouTube, we're, on your behalf, are able to move that data automatically inside of BigQuery so that your analysts can use any number of holistic tools like SQL or Python to analyze that data together or with data sets that you own that you bring into BigQuery as well. And we'll be uh, bringing in other data sets into BigQuery as well in the future. So our clients tell us there are really three major ways to use Google Cloud Platform to derive value for your organization. The first one I already talked about is the, this cloud-native data warehouse concept that BigQuery holds, and it's really transformative, right? It's, it's changing how folks think about data and how folks think about analyzing data in real time in SQL. The second one is management on Hadoop and Spark. It's 2017, it's been 11 years since Hadoop first came around, and Hadoop is still very, very hard to work with, right? It's, it's a big headache. It's not unusual for clients to tell me that it takes six to nine months on premise for them to get more infrastructure, to get more storage or more compute capacity to increase the size of their Hadoop clusters. Six to nine months. And at the same time, once you do have capacity, Sometimes I'm being told that a runaway query can take down the whole thing, right? And, and there are tools like your resource manager allow, that allow you to, to kind of break up the resources, but it still doesn't go far. So Google's Hadoop and Spark service called Dataproc allows you to spin up clusters in seconds, right? The 98th percentile of performance to get a cluster up and running is about 60 seconds, which is incredible. The third uh, use case that I can talk about is real-time analytics. Now, there's nothing wrong with, with waiting a day or two until you get analysis into your, into your, uh, your business. But there are use cases where you want data analyzed in real time. Philips Hue is a great example of that, right? You want na analytics on your uh, application as quickly as possible. So IoT, gaming, and clickstream are three of the examples that uh, that where uh, real-time analytics becomes really useful. Now, we've taken care of the application layer. We know what the shape of the data looks like. But to truly get the most out of your data, you can start embracing machine learning and AI. And this is a relatively new concept, of course. Uh, actually, it's a relatively old concept. But because of the advancements in computing, it's become a, a practical concept these days. And Google is really attempting to democratize the concept of the AI through our investments in TensorFlow, which is a very popular open source project, through our acquisition of Kaggle, which is a community of AI and machine learning experts. And of course, through our fully managed machine learning service, Cloud ML Engine. Cloud Machine Learning Engine allows you to train your custom TensorFlow models on your data using our CPUs and GPUs. We abstract away the complexity of running a distributed TensorFlow cluster, so you can just focus on the really difficult problem, which is machine learning. And once you have the trained data set, once you have your model in place, you can take that model for inference for future use on-premise, onto a mobile device, or onto a Google Cloud. And of course, we, we all know that AI is hard. Machine learning is very, very hard, right? Not everybody's ready. There's not a whole lot of talent that really expertly knows machine learning. To that extent, we are externalizing, and we have externalized, a number of pre-trained machine learning models that power the same tools that Google uses today. For example, Google Photos, or Google Image Search, uh, or Google Safe Search, or actually Google Translate, right? So this, these same models are being externalized for you to use so that any engineer that knows how to work with a REST API or, or JavaScript can build an application that can talk, that can be machine learning driven, AI driven, and can talk to the real world. I'm going to talk about a couple of these. The first one is Vision API. Uh, 
It's been uh, available over the past year or so, and they've actually annotated over a billion and a half images by now. A couple of use cases. The first one is uh, uh, real estate companies often take images of you know, real estate properties and, and uh, extract metadata that facilitates transactions. The second one is social media companies are able to leverage the Vision API to filter out you know, inappropriate content. There are two, and the Vision API, just like all of our services, tends to iterate and innovate, right? You kind of get better and better features, more and more features as time goes on. It's an intrinsic quality of Google Cloud. Two of the most recent features, features that Vision API has introduced are advanced OCR and implementation of knowledge graph method, metadata. Advanced OCR, or optical character recognition, allows you to uh, visualize or to translate uh, uh, vi physical documents, like legal documents or medical documents, translate them into text, extract the text away from that. And knowledge graph metadata, essentially, uh, essentially what Google did is we tied together the Vision API with our knowledge graph metadata database, so that the same uh, the same metadata database that powers Google Images, for example, you are able to use today, right? So it's just enrichment of this Vision API with Google's internal tools. Um, the next one is actually just, just fascinating as well, and, and you guys will get to, uh, to take a look at what, what this looks like in uh, live. The vast majority of data that's being generated today in the world is really videos, hundreds of terabytes every single hour. And it's very hard to work with videos, right? You can't run SQL on it. You can't really store it in a database. So what if you could extract valuable information about your videos, video content, in a very simple manner? And I have Lee to demonstrate that for us. Thank you, Tino. Actually, I'm very excited today to uh, demonstrate the Video Intelligence API because it's really one of my favorite uh, Google Cloud products uh, that's online. So uh, I will explain to you first what it is. It is machine learning. Uh, it's a pre-trained model that we as developers can use through a REST API. So you don't need to be a, a data scientist or build hard stuff. It's already there. Um, and once you connect to this REST API, um, machine learning can understand the context of the video and also detect per screen, uh, per scene, uh, what's in the scene and um, will label it and also uh, will give you back on which timestamp that happened. And uh, I can show you that in, an, in a real demo, I have here a video of... Um, uh, actually, it was a video of uh, YouTube searches in 2016, where all uh, things what happened in uh, in the year 2016. So I'm scrolling through it, and you see like lots of people, things of uh, politics and and sports. And um, if you scroll down, you can see the Video Intelligence API detected all these keywords, so that all everything that's happening in this video. Now, imagine that you have a company. You no longer need to watch a full video to label or categorize a video, but you can let the computer basically do that and also see on what uh, time that happens. So if we can see here, uh, apparently in this scene, there is a dog. And uh, here's a construction worker. I think that's amazing. Let's uh, think about another use case, um, and I think that's probably uh, real life. Let's say you have a company and you have, like, petabytes of video files uh, on your website, and uh, you need to find a certain scene um, to highlight that. So let's, let's try that out. Um, since it's officially summer today, I thought like maybe it's nice to uh, look for the word uh, beaches and see if we have uh, videos uh, that contain a beach. And there you see. These are all videos with beaches. and. Um, As you can see, you see also on which uh, time uh, frame uh, the, the beach area did that happen. So if I could click here, then um, let, me, let me refresh the page. Then you should see that indeed also the, where, the, where the beach was really happening. Nope. And that is actually pretty amazing because I, if I would blink my eye, I probably would have missed it. So. This is really great. Um, now I hand it over back to Tino. Wow. 
Thanks, Lee. Lee and Robert are uh, customer engineers here in Amsterdam, and uh, it's it's. Uh, uh, I've said this before, customer engineers at Google probably have the coolest jobs. They get, to, they get to use all the cool toys, and they get to talk to customers and solve your real-world problems. And they get to demo stuff. Video, video intelligence API is really indicative of what Google Cloud Platform is trying to do in general. Right? It's, video intelligence API is the result of intense investments in AI and data science and lots of research inside of Google that makes its way into your hands as a customer but also through a very, very high level of abstraction so that your everyday analysts and your ed everyday engineers can leverage a simple API to, to provide really valuable use cases and to have your applications actually interact with the world in the same way humans do. This is fascinating, right? This, this, uh, this new reality that we live in. And so to kind of wrap up, I'd like to, to kind of give you a little bit of a, of a thought. Today, you, you must embrace data. You must embrace the fact that uh, data drives all decisions making in the world, right? And so in order to, to really propel yourself and to innovate further, you need to take care of all the layers of data management, all the way from the application database to the analytics database, and then potentially even to AI and machine learning. And with that, I'd like to introduce Bill, who is actually head of uh, customer engineers here for uh, EMEA. And Bill is going to talk about how Google allows it to collaborate. Thanks, Tino. Appreciate it. Yeah. So like Tino said, my name is Bill Hippemeyer, and I recently have moved from uh, California, our Mountain View office, to London so that we could build out our customer engineering organization across EMEA. We're making big investments in our go-to-market forces, and it's, it's Diane Green's belief, and my belief as well, that we're going to engage best with you when we go engineer to engineer. When we have people that have knowledge about products, capabilities uh, that we provide, can apply those to problems that you have and show you the art of the possible of what's going next. The problem is, and here's something we really have to pause on for a minute, is that we're all trying to drive these transformation outcomes, right? new methods, new ways to approach problems, new markets, new customer solutions, new ways to interact with partners and the ecosystem with which we work. That's great. That comes from what? That innovation is really a result of transformative ideas that we create and think about in the workplace with these same partners. Those transformative ideas are built on creativity. Creativity is the crucible which allows us to come up with new ideas which lead to transformation. But the question I have for you as an audience today, as you sit there, is what is the catalyst for that creative process, right? What is it that gets people to be able to come up with new ideas and actually think of a different approach, a different way, a different method to be able to affect an outcome that does it? I submit to you that that is engagement. When two or more people get together, they lock themselves in a room, in a conference place, or they're in a Google Doc working together in real time, they're starting to create, think, and reason together. And what happens, and you all have this experience, is you begin to synthesize new ideas from existing components, existing facts, and your observations about the world around you. And that's what we are doing in Google Cloud in our collaboration suite. We've had great success introducing G Suite uh, just over, just around 10 years ago. I joined Google uh, around 2007, so I've been com I'm coming up on my 10 year anniversary, and I began the Google journey in the collaboration space. And when Google brings a new product to market, our thinking is how do we impact over a billion people? How do we solve problems that no one else is addressing? And how do we bring something that is unique to the flavor that only Google can do? And this is what we believe we have delivered in the context of G Suite. There's a problem though. We have a great suite of capabilities, right? Uh, from real-time collaboration to meetings to Google Drive to all these great products that service that collaborative effort and allow you to connect and create together. But what we've recognized is that that's not enough. It's not enough to just be able to create and to be able to work together in real time. We have to take the power of machine learning and apply it to everything we're doing because what's happening in the workplace today is there are obstacles to my creating the next big idea. And those obstacles are number one, 
I don't have enough time. I've got to create space for creativity, right? I've got to have a set of tools that will optimize my day, optimize the way I work, find the things I need when I need them so that I can create more room for creativity and more room for collaboration. The second thing that I have to do is I have to lift my game, right? I have to be able to work smarter and work more intelligently, and I have to do so using best practices of those that are around me, experts within the field in my sphere of influence and outside of my sphere of influence. So I've got to have intelligent solutions that allow me to do that. The third thing is the tools have to be built fundamentally for teams, not for individuals. Right? We need to have tools that actually get us to engage, to get that catalyst working, to create, to transform, and then reap the rewards of that. And then finally, the fourth point which is important is that I've got to have tools that integrate with the back office, integrate with the workflow, and integrate with the other components that I use on a daily basis, like the ERP system and the CRM system. So what I want to do over the next couple of minutes is I want to give you a glimpse into some of the things that we're doing in Google to help us solve those four problems that will allow us to arrive at the transformations we need and, de and, and demand in today's world. Let's start a little bit with artificial intelligence. All right? As you know, Google's been working in this field for a long, long time, and many of you have experienced the benefit of Type Ahead, which is built on an AI algorithm that examines all of the different words that people are typing in in different languages to provide useful suggestions to be able to allow you to find information. That's a great example of time savings, right? When you use Type Ahead as an example, you're finding results faster. You're finding more relevant results and you're getting to the information you need quickly to get that. But that can be integrated into everything we do. So let's take a look at what we're doing in artificial intelligence, right? We're working on systems integrated into the G Suite product that will allow you to recover lost time, improve your team effectiveness, and cover, uncover big ideas. And let's begin with Drive. So the first innovation that I want to talk to you about is Drive Quick Access. Drive Quick Access is a mechanism by which we are looking at your schedule. We are looking at the interactions you have in chat. We are examining the things that you're doing as you collaborate with the people around you, and then we're surfacing the content that you need at a fingertip when you need it. It turns out that if you measure it, over 40% of the documents that you need are now being accessed directly from this new capability in Drive called Quick Access. So when I open up Drive now and I look at the top bar, Yes, there's a search bar up there, and yes, it's very useful to be able to do type ahead searches to find information, but more importantly, the documents that I'm most likely to need are presented to me based on the context and algorithms that we're building in and using in artificial intelligence to surface this content. So that's an example of giving you more time. It might be in microseconds or seconds, but if you add that up, what that's gonna do across the suite is gonna allow you to have more productive thought time, more productive uh, opportunities to engage with others. The second innovation that we brought to market is the explore functionality within Sheets. I don't know about you, but I'm pretty good with spreadsheets but I am not the guru that can write a very, very complex statement that uses all of the complexities of the spreadsheet language to be able to search and find things in cells. Here's an example of a question, right? What is the most frequent garment type from the point of sale data that I've been collecting over the last 10 years, analyzed by geography, by location, uh, by language, by uh, segment of the market, right? When you ask that question, how many of you can immediately write the formula that's gonna look at potentially terabytes of information and be able to pull that information up and, in, and put it in a graph in a matter of seconds? That's not an easy thing to do, right? The best people that know spreadsheets that work with this data do it well, but the average person struggles a bit with that, with that formula. So you can go into Explore right now and you can use the natural language query processing and you can simply ask that question. Right? What is the most frequent garment type? And then you can add things to it by geography, etc., that I talked about earlier. And we will actually not only show you the results of that query, 
but we'll also write the formula for you. So if you want to take that formula and drop it into the cells that, that apply and do the summarization, you'll get that immediately. And now the next person that wants to come into that sheet and examine that content, they do not have to be able to write the formula. They don't even have to know to ask the question. The information is available to them, processed and ready to go. So being able to raise your game, raise your ability to interact with the data, move to a natural language processing capability is one of the outcomes that you get from the application of AI and machine learning into, uh, in this case, Sheets. But how do we enhance your ability to collaborate together? Well, there are a number of things that we're releasing in the product now and have recently released to be able to get people to be able to engage more proactively, engage in real time. We've talked about Google Drive, and Google Drive is going to be the next. We predict by the end of this year that Google Drive will be over the billion, uh, the billion monthly active user uh, point. And when we measure an active user, that is not a registered user. That is someone who is a seven-day active, somebody who's used the product in the context of the last seven days. So finding your information and placing your documents in Drive we think is good. But that, again, is not enough. So this year we announced Team Drive. Team Drive is that creative space where I can declaratively create the space, I can add the colleagues and people that are working with me on a particular project, and then now what happens is all the content that we, that we create, all the content that we interact with, and all the stuff that we store belongs to the team, not the individual. This solves a number of problems. The first problem it solves is, what happens when a new team member comes in to your existing file structure system. You have to go through and do all the shares required to be able to bring that person into the project. With Team Drive, we eliminate that need. As soon as a new person joins the team, they automatically have access to the content that they need to be able to collaborate with you and drive the project forward. The other problem we're solving with Team Drive is what do you do with the content when someone leaves the organization? If you're using a traditional file store, a NetApp filer, and even a cloud storage uh, solution from another vendor, you have to go through this process of trying to figure out when that person leaves and I'm going to eliminate their idea, what is the disposition of their content? Who do I give it to? Do I give it to their manager? Do I divide it up among the team members? And how do I go about and make sure that every single document is appropriately disposed of and placed in its proper place? With Team Drive, you don't have to worry about that. When someone leaves the team or leaves the organization, the content doesn't belong to the individual. The content belongs to the team, belongs to the organization. It's a better place to collaborate and it's more effective. We're also doing a lot in chat. Chat is a great tool that is traditionally done one-to-one. -one. Occasionally, you'll get into a group chat, but you're not really thinking about it in the terms of a team experience, where I have a repository of interactions that I'm having with the team, and I have continuity of the conversations through time. So we are bringing to market a new capability, which is Hangouts Chat. And Hangouts Chat is designed to solve that problem of being able to give you a team an organizational view of the conversations that you have, the informal conversations you have to be able to move work forward. We also are greatly enhancing our, our Hangout product and relabeling that as Hangouts Meet. In Hangouts, uh, if you've used Hangouts, you can see what a great tool it is to be able to immediately connect to a number of people both in and outside of the organization to be able to have a video collaboration experience. But what you need to make it an enterprise capability is you need things like the ability to record a meeting, right? How many times do you do a team meeting or maybe an all-hands call where you're giving out important content, but there are people that are on holiday. There are people that are sick. There are people that have conflicting meetings and can't make it that. You need to be able to have the ability to record content. You also need to make it seamless for people to be able to get into the meeting regardless of what device or what location they are and what the power of their network is. So why shouldn't every single meeting have a bridge, a phone bridge, where if I'm in a low bandwidth uh, location and it's not possible for me to get the best out of my IP network, why shouldn't I automatically offer you the ability to dial into the bridge and, and just click a button and be able to be connected into that? Why can't I connect other people without having to do the click, 
the uh, type in the conference bridge number, type in the leader code, you know, go through all the sequence of numbers, realizing that you mistyped the fifth digit of a 15 digit number and all the hassle associated with joining a meeting that way. It should be one click, it should be automatic, it should be accessible from mobile, from desktop, and from any location that you're in. So we're doing a lot in Hangouts Meet to be able to bring the power of Hangouts to the enterprise. You also need to increase the number of people that are interacting, so we're going and increasing that number every single uh, year to be able to make it so you can have large meetings as well as intimate small meetings. So that's what we're doing, an example of some of the things we're doing around team collaboration and getting people together. What about that fourth place? What about the integration, right, of your workplace to where when I'm in email and I need to be able to get to another application, I can do it quickly. What about actually building applications that use these capabilities to be able to provide new services to your organization and to your customers and partners? Well, the traditional development strategy, right, is great if you're a computer science software engineer. So if you're a Python programmer or a Java programmer and you want to go in and write a, a complex system and use all the power that the cloud has to offer, right? Uh, that, that's, that's wonderful. But what if you're a power business user, right? Where has the market left you in terms of building a dynamic and active application built on top of this infrastructure and built on platform as a service to where I can build a simple application as a power user, deploy that into Google Cloud and have it automatically scale to billions of users should I need that capability. Well, I'd like to introduce you to a platform and a development capability called AppMaker and I think the best way to introduce you to that is to show you a video of people that are using it today and the experience that they've had. Let's roll the video. You're on Google, and you're enjoying the collaboration products, mail, calendar, contacts. However, you also have this need for business process to be automated. Our agency, they don't have the money to do a full-fledged app. They just need something simple that makes their life easier. Right now we have the blue form because it's a blue sheet of paper. The Wyoming Flexible Benefits Enrollment Plan. You're filling it out and signing it, and then they have to data entry all that back in. 10,000 people, a lot of blue trees. <laughs> we were able to make this an app maker. We showed it to our HR department, and they were so excited. Honestly, at first I was very skeptical. It just seemed too easy. Like, oh yeah, I drag and drop a couple little things. What do I care? I'm a real developer. I don't use these little gadgets. But as I got to use the tool more, I was like, wow, you know, this really can do some pretty cool stuff. I was able to develop a relatively sophisticated app for login monitoring from ideation all the way through the final delivered app to our administrators for them to use was five weeks. And that's just unheard of in any other kind of product lifecycle. Why app maker? Because not everyone is me. I really like working deep down in the code, working low level. The great thing about AppMaker is you don't need to have that deep down knowledge. People are able to make these really snazzy looking applications that can be used by an entire company. I never picture myself developing anything. AppMaker is an insanely awesome way to solve a small problem. AppMaker makes my job easier because I, I, I don't need multiple tools. I can just develop it directly on AppMaker. One word to describe AppMaker, simple. Quick, flexible. Versatile. Empowerment. One word to describe AppMaker, game changer. So AppMaker creates the development environment which, which can build simple applications that scale to billions of users on top of Google infrastructure and it sits on top of a rich set of APIs. So not only can you build applications, but you can also build applications that integrate your collaboration environment. So we've uh, announced the Spreadsheets API and the Slides API as examples of APIs that allow you to start to programmatically create content, programmatically manipulate slide decks and do those types of things so that you can actually integrate these types of workflows. In addition to that, we've also introduced the concept of Gmail add-ons. Right? When you're working in the context of your email inbox, that is where I get a lot of my to-dos. That is where I'm actually wanting to do most of my work. So in the morning, I might get, for example, a customer 
complaint or an issue or a concern or some sort of escalation. In that might be a trouble ticket, right? I don't want to have to leave the context of my email, go in and log into the trouble ticketing system, look up the reference of the trouble, find out what's been done on that ticket in the last 24 hours, contact the engineer that's working on it to get information. Why can't I simply integrate that experience where I can click on the, the ticket number and through Gmail add-ons surface the application directly in the context of the work I'm doing, go and look the information up I need, grab some of that information, stick it back into the email reply, and reduce the time it takes to effectively resolve a customer concern. If you add those up over the course of your year, you begin to free up, you begin to work more collaboratively, you're able to actually leverage the power of a collaboration solution that was built for teams. So we have a bunch of technology here in the collaboration suite. We think it's differentiated and we think it will help you do what? We think our collaboration suite uniquely helps you achieve the transformative outcomes you're doing based on coming up with big ideas, which is fostered by a creative environment, which is catalyzed by your ability to engage with others. So with that, what I'd like to do is take you to the final round. We're now in the US, we would say in baseball, we're heading around third and we're going home now. And to do that, I would like to bring up Andre, uh, who is gonna talk a little bit about what we're doing to maintain an open environment so that you can make sure that when you build things on our platform that they're gonna run in other places and that you're gonna work in an open platform. So Andre? Thank you. Wow, what an audience. You can't believe how excited I am about this. Absolutely fantastic. How are you guys doing? How is everybody doing? Us? Also in the, um, the breakout rooms, so we have overflow rooms. We, uh, I just looked and we have over 14, almost 1,500 folks uh, in the venue now. You can hear the buzz from the partner room. To me, this is absolutely, absolutely exciting. Um, four years ago, I started in Google, and uh, it went like this. Hey, Andre, um, just here you have the Benelux, the Nordics, northern of Europe, and just go and build uh, the business for cloud platforms. So that's, that's where I started, and it was absolutely an amazing journey. Uh, many, many uh, known faces in the public. Uh, uh, working with Philips was really amazing. Uh, winning Spotify was absolutely fantastic. Cool Blue, there's so many customers. I'm really privileged to have seen that. One of the reasons that I joined Google is um, Google's vision on openness. And today, I would like to speak with you especially about that. And there's three pieces I would like to touch here. One, Google's support for open source and how Google believes that it will speed up innovation. Second is how we are open to other technologies. And third, flexibility in pricing and how Google believes that uh, pricing should be flexible and drive waste down to zero. Imagine that you are in a new market, and you are in a new market one way or the other. Everybody here, right? The next big thing. And your competition has a three-year or multi-year head start in front of you. What are you going to do? How are you going to compete? You might think of Google Cloud, maybe. Now, this happened to Linux. And 20 years ago, the internet, that was the next big thing. And honest, Linux was not such a great platform in those days. Yahoo was really big, they had their own uh, operating system. Uh, Solaris was super, super popular. And we all know what happened. Unix became the platform of the internet, right? Because it's open. Not really, because it's open because it is had a higher rate of innovation. Google has a long-standing history of supporting open source systems. Linux, Git, C++, many of those. That is all anecdotal, right? So let's look at some numbers. Over 280,000 commits from Google.com accounts in one year, 2016. So if you do the math, it's 700 per day. That's super amazing, right? 15,000 uh, projects that, uh, that Google is supporting. Over 2,500 long during projects going on. And there's another piece here. Open source is steering a community of high collaboration. 
and of high innovation and high speeds of innovation. Let's look at an example. What started out as Googlers adding functionality to the C kernel of Linux to just manage resources like CPU sets and, and other resources grew into what we know now as containers, microservices, and 12 years later now, companies around the world, people around the world are speeding up application development and DevOps uh, through, uh, through containers. And at Google, we use that, of course, also. And containers in itself are great. Containers also need to be managed. They need to be orchestrated, right? So in Google, we have this humongous robot that we lovingly call Borg. And I know we make the, we make the jokes. <laughs> yeah, resistance is futile, right? And Borg, we made a super bold decision. Borg, by the way, in Google, is, is orchestrating over 2 billion microservices a day. So that is, it is quite a, a humongous robot. And we made a bold decision. What we did is we open sourced Borg. And we gave the code and the management of IP to the Linux Foundation. And there Kubernetes was born. And look at what happened. Kubernetes, this is the Kubernetes project. 4,000 projects, 400 years of effort went into Kubernetes. 400 years in, in the last three years. Now you think, what does that matter? Well, at Google we believe that freedom matters most. You write your code once, and then you decide where I'm going to run it, on premise, in my private cloud, maybe, maybe in multiple clouds, maybe on the Google Cloud. So in essence, it means at any point you can leave. And it also means at any point you can join. Now, this is true for the stuff that you're orchestrating with Kubernetes. It also counts for Kubernetes instances itself. You can run it with us. You can also use our managed Kubernetes, right? And it also is true for well, take TensorFlow. We open source that, right? So you can run it on premise, you can run it in the cloud, but you also can use our, uh, our managed services for machine learning, CloudML, right? Or you can even go higher and use our trained data sets, like we saw beautiful, video, beautiful demos of the video API and all that stuff from Lee. The second part I would like to touch is how open we are for other technologies. How many? A few in the audience are in financial services and touching, uh, touching COBOL. Somewhere, yeah. So it happens, right? So <clears throat> anything that you can run in a container, now you can point at with, with App Engine Flex. And you can pull it in and run it inside. So next to App Engine, how we support our platforms like uh, Python and Go and all the seven, you can now also add, add all your code and put it in and use App Engine Flex, which is absolutely awesome. Another piece that I'm proud of, that is our continuous support for Windows. And not to just be an OK platform to run Windows code on. No, we really want to be the best, high-performing place for Windows to be. So you really, that people really like to be, bring their code, bring Visual Studio. For example, Visual Studio has an SDK to seamlessly integrate your IDE integrated uh, development environment into our cloud. We support all versions of SQL Server, Web Edition, Standard Edition, and we also uh, announced uh, support for Enterprise Edition. We have numerous support for um, uh, no, uh, pre-installed uh, images for Windows Server, all those versions, right? And also now in beta, we have support for .NET Core. So we touched open source, and how we believe that it's speeding up our, uh, our innovation. We touched being open for other code and other, uh, uh, other technologies. Now I would like to look at pricing and flexibility of pricing. When I speak with people about uh, their bill, their spend on, on cloud, they're usually not that happy. And that is not because of cost. Usually that is because of waste. That is fixed VMs, uh, uh, per hour billing, uh, and then having three years leases of those fixed VMs. And I got told somewhere that cloud is about flexible resource and uh, 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 elastic resource capacity and all that stuff. So Google believes that pricing should be flexible and that you should have as minimum waste. And 
2014, in March it was in 2014, Google committed itself, ourselves, to follow Moore's law. You remember every year doubling of compute power. So where does the, the margin go? And the 6% where the cloud was going down. And then we started driving the price down. Keep stick with Moore's law. And we started innovating. An example of this innovation is automatic sustained usage discount. And honestly, you cannot screw this up. Really, you run a VM, and the, after the first quarter of the month, discount starts kicking in automatically, right? Until 30% in the end of the month. It's pretty unique. <clears throat> Another example is um, how we have custom machine types. If you have a 24-core, 60-gigabyte RAM instance, if you need that, we believe that you should be able to run that. And this reminds me vividly of um, um, uh, after all the work on technology and vision with Spotify that we did. I know them very well. We had uh, commercial negotiations, and they had clusters, thousands of nodes for Hadoop, and they had exotic instances. And we were trying to create a business case because the strategy was we first lift and shift, and then we peel up that, uh, that Hadoop cluster and get on the higher level servers, right? Like Sebastian said in the beginning. And we could not close the business case. Either too much CPU or cores and, or uh, too much memory. And then we did something special. Uh, Tommy Kirscher was there. He said, uh, hey, uh, let me call some folks in the dungeon and we create a special SKU for them, a special instance type. And we did. And there we could compare apples to apples. And now we have available for you custom machine types so you can compare apples to apples in your environment, right? And if you don't know what the right size is, we are monitoring your infrastructure. So we will recommend you. We won't do music recommendations to you, but this is more like a machine type recommendation, okay? So you will get it right. And usually, in the beginning, through development, your uh, requirements on your environment is very, very different than in the times of uh, your operations later on. So things change. So if you, if you are planning your infrastructure in the development phase, you might go off of the line. And you, generate waste. And then per hour mil uh, billing. So uh, we have true per hour billing. 11 minutes is 11 minutes, right? So you don't have to put an alarm clock on the top of the hour and uh, to start and stop your clusters there. Now, all these elements are working as a tandem, right? Whether it's um, a sustained users discount, that we're driving our prices down, or custom machine types, they all work as a tandem. And we know, we have seen that average uh, prices, uh, average uh, bills are going, uh, you can be cheaper, like 60%, and no, nobody's average here, right? I would like to close with one. Open source, Google believes that that's the way to speed up innovation uh, for Google. Two, we are open, very open to other technologies, a great home for other technologies. And three, we, are, uh, we have a flexible pricing so that we can drive, you can drive waste to zero. And now I would like to welcome to stage uh, Misha Bruinfeld of WordPress, and he has a great example of bringing code and .NET to, uh, to our platform. And Misha, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. Thank you, Google Next 17. Uh, there was people leaving, and I just learned from the organization here that the breakout sessions will start as of 11.30 after this meeting. So please all stay here so you can learn on all these wonderful presentations. So my name is Michel Bruinfels. I am director of contests at WordPress Photo. And you probably you know WordPress Photo for the WordPress Photo of the year. And the WordPress Photo is the most important photojournalistic contest in the world. Actually, we say these times we are the most important visual journalism contest in the world. And I want to explain why. So I'm going to talk about exchanging visual information. And exchanging visual information will start with a lovely video made by George Beckley. And this is about 165 years, listen up, 165 years of front pages of the New York Times.
So here you see some illustrations, which took about 50 years. And then somewhere after more than like 100 years, no, somewhere in the beginning of the 20th century, they started to have pictures as well. And as of the 1950s, regular pictures on the front page. And this, this is the 90s. Colored pictures of the front page of the most important newspaper in the world, as they say. So what I actually wanted to discuss with you guys is actually to go back like 20 years ago. We are an organization. We were started in 1955, and which is about still, about still photography. And somewhere here in 1998, digital came in. So we accepted digital photographs in our contest. It's not even 20 years ago. And you see what happened. Blue is digital. So within five years, slides were very expensive. They left. Prints were out quite soon as well, as they were quite expensive as well. Digital took over. So what happened with the digital? So digital took over completely. We received more entries. And people from all over the world were able to enter their entries to WordPress Photo. And please be aware, the figures are not that high, but that's because WordPress Photo is a contest for professional photographers. So it's not for everyone. So these things happen. Digital comes in. Everyone is taking pictures with this. But it really took a while before, in this professional contest, a picture taken with a mobile camera or with a mobile phone did win. This is a picture from two years ago. But also other mediums actually were used creating visual storytelling. Google Street View won in 2011 with a story in the World Press Photo of the Year. The story is called A Series of Unfortunate Events, and it was a really, really great story. You can see it on our, on our website. So people were using different stuff digitally to actually create visual storytelling. And we are aware of that at WordPress Photo. So as I said before, I am the director of contests. So in 1955, we started out with a photo contest. And since 2011, we have a digital storytelling contest. Since we are aware at our organization that visual stories are produced in a different way and are consumed in a different way. So it's not only stills anymore. Here on the, we have video and we have interactive stories. Visual storytelling, journalistic visual storytelling, using different tools to actually you know, um, tell the story which needs to be told to the public. This is actually a touch screen, which is traveling together with our exhibition to about 100 locations worldwide to actually show what is happening in the world of visual journalism. Talking about producing and consuming visual stories. Snapchat, 1.8 million snaps per minute. Who's having Snapchat here? Uh, you're too old. YouTube, 4.1 million videos viewed per minute, which is like 6 billion a day. The Snapchats, in the end, is like 2.5 billion snaps transferred per day. It's massive. And you know, I need to tell you with these things, talking about who is producing this visual storytelling, it's not me. Who is doing this? This is my niece. She is 12. And she's, this is how she's communicating with me after I told her I was actually coming over. And she said, well, maybe this is a funny picture. There is a total new generation growing up with communicating with visuals. So we are aware of this as an organization. And we want to change. And this is a picture from 2013. This is the World Press Photo of the Year 2013. 
It's made by John Stenmeyer. And what we find out, you know, we are learning on this visual storytelling. And what we really want is, you know, we want to keep up with the speed. You know, we want to inform the people. So actually what we did is we are talking to creators and that they actually, you know, can use the tools they love and are very effective. So we teamed up with Q42 and we created the bigger picture. And these guys from Q42 are longtime .NET experts. And they helped us with creating this amazing project, which I will show you in a minute, around exploring photos and exploring context. Data journalism, using a picture as an entry point for data journalism. Since we want to reach out to this worldwide audience, and we're using Google Cloud for this. So I actually want to, I'm finishing my presentation with a thing how we're going to explore the context and expose data journalism on this picture. So what we think at WordPress Photo is we think it is really important to tell the story. So this is actually, you know, the saying a picture says more than a thousand words, of course, but a lot of ones and a lot of zeros can actually tell you much more about this picture. So, you know, who are these people? These people are African migrants on the shore in Djibouti city. They're trying to catch cell signals from neighboring Somalia since they want to get in touch with their relatives before transferring the Red Sea. So that's these people. So this is the entry point. But, you know, we want to know who are these people? So we actually want to explore the mobile owner or the mobile phone ownership which they have and which is quite low for refugees, but it's really important to have a mobile phone for refugees. What are these barriers for, you know, to connectivity for these refugees when they actually travel or when they actually are migrating? This connectivity for these migrants is critical in the end, since they need to communicate with friends and they need to communicate with others about where they're actually going and how they can go there and how they can reach better places. So they, so they use it for navigations and for directions, you know, to get to the next destination quicker and hopefully safe. To secure safe routes. And it's also resilience because, you know, the people who are, you know, the migrants who are actually like migrating, who actually are able to keep in touch with their family, for them, it's actually, you know, they have like the best way actually to succeed in the end. In the end, this connectivity empowers. So it's vital to empower refugees and to educate themselves and for earning a livelihood in this refugee site. So for us, as WordPress Photo, it is really important not only to show this picture, but also to tell the story behind which we want to share with you and with the public all over. So thank you, Google Cloud, for making that possible. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't have any more slides. Just to uh, close this morning, uh, uh, in 10 seconds, first of all, uh, uh, thank you very much for all the speakers. Thank you very much for the customers. Uh, it's always very inspiring to have true stories. I mean, the technology is cool, it's great, it's powerful, but at the end of the day, it's about solving business issues and it's really about hearing from our customers. So we had great customers this morning. If you want to extend the experience, the customer experience, go to YouTube. I mean, go to YouTube, type Next, Google Next, and you'll see a lot, a lot of different customer stories in each and every single industry. So this is great. Because at the end of the day, it's really about you bringing your ideas every day. Every day, we are hosting companies, actually. Everybody is coming with new ideas, and they are telling us, we started the cloud journey, not necessarily with Google a few years, but now with everything Google is doing, the cool technologies, the machine learning, artificial intelligence, the data analytics, and so on, 
you clearly, we clearly do a lot of things that we couldn't do actually with the, uh, uh, the first partners we started the journey. You know, it's not a one player journey, it's a multi player journey. And again, we are really, really here to uh, get challenged and share the technology and start working with you uh, on the migration. Having said that, this is the end of the morning. We are a little bit late, uh, so we are going to start sharp, really sharp in 10 minutes, all the breakout sessions. So thank you very much and have a great day. It was it.